Hi, this video is an introduction to um, contract screen printing of electrodes from Zimmer and Peacock. So at ZP we are um, contacted by people who request us to do sort of the manufacture of a custom screen printed design and so this video is really designed for people like that. So a request for a custom screen printed design will come in so we're going to discuss that. We are going to discuss in this slide also the importance or not of tolerances. So everyone puts tolerances onto these screen printed electrodes, but um, at ZP we can actually take a very holistic approach to this um, tolerances and we'll discuss that here. We will talk about inspection screen printed electrodes, because so when these requests come in, what doesn't often come in is any discussion about IQC and OQC, so we are going to touch upon that. As I say, we are going to touch upon um, a holistic look at screen printed electrodes. I mean, screen printed electrodes, especially in sensor and biosensor um, technology stacks, are so essentially at the bottom of the stack. You've got a screen printed electrode, you've got a formulation, you've got electronics, you've got excitation, you've got raw signal, you've got signal processing, and then you've got a final number. So you really have to look, even when you're talking about just custom um, manufacture of screen printed electrodes, you do have to consider the inter entire um, technology stack. And we're also then importantly going to be talking about onboarding as a ZP client. Um, so first of all, request for screen printed electrode. So the first thing that comes in is somebody says, I want a screen printed electrode with some sort of gross um, dimensions, you know, certain length, certain width, um, certain thickness, um, certain print thickness, which we can, you know, everyone can essentially understand these things. What is rarer is that people come in and say, and in that specification, I want a certain, um, let's say, electrode roughness. Now, that's okay because it can be measured, but we have seen situations in the past where people are going from one manufacturer to another manufacturer, and though everything is grossly the same, in fact, the electrodes, for example, have different roughnesses. So essentially sensitivities all jump up or baselines all jump up. Um, whether you need to do this or not will be discussed um, later on. The other part that needs to be, that's very rarely called out, sometimes it's called out, not all the time, is actual electrical resistance of these um, tracks. Um, whether it's important or not depends, you know, if the, if the tracks are highly resistive, it's sort of more significant. And if they um, sort of have resistances of like one ohm, etc., then it's, they're so low anyway, it becomes less important, you know, to actually sort of measure it or even have that stringent tolerances around it but it's, it is more rarely called out roughness is never called out electrical resistance is very rarely called out um now at zp what's what we never find called out in, when people send us a specification is actually functional testing you know a screen printed electrodes should be in some ways tested in the way that it will actually be used in the final application. So at Zimmer and Peacock, we're quite lucky, not lucky. We've got a proprietary database called Julie. It's a cloud system. At ZP, we're very industrially set up when it comes to electrochemical testing and characterization. So we can gather large amounts of data. So, you know, screen printed electrodes can come off the line. We can essentially test them in parallel. We can upload the data and we can do batch analysis on these kind of sensors. So on the left-hand side, we're showing the um, cyclovoltamogram characterization of a screen-printed electrode. On the, on the right-hand side, we're showing the functional testing of a screen-printed electrode that's become a um, generation two um, glucose sensor. And here, we just happen to be testing it in what we call a staircase experiment from <clears throat> zero micromolar to 140 micromolar um, because the particular application um, required that. And again, that, that data and can go into Julian. We can do all the analysis on that and we will retouch upon this particular data set um, later on. So, so far, we're just discussing, you know, the kind of, you know, the general workflow. People have a, um, a desire for a, let's say, custom screen printed electrode. They might send a requirement, oh, sorry, a specification to ZP. They might send some drawings to ZP. In there, they'll definitely talk about uh, mechanical dimensions, um, they never talk about roughness of electrodes and they more and they do sometimes talk about electrical resistance but they never talk about actual electrochemical characterization of said um, screen printed electrode 
And for us, that means they're really just ignoring what's called the OQC. Um, so we need to discuss that. Now, in terms of tolerances, people can sometimes be very stringent or strict on um, tolerances. So, you know, when we talk about tolerances, we're talking about, you know, there's some very important parts of screen printed electorate, often around the work encounter and reference electorates. So we understand that people have a desire to kind of control these conditions. Um, the first question is, are tolerances important? And the answer to that is yes and no, and it depends. And we'll discuss why, um, it, whether it's important or not to control tolerances will be discussed um, in a bit. And I think a common mistake is really to think about the screen printed electrode in isolation of the entire technology stack. Whether you need strict or more loose tolerances depends on how you're thinking about those tolerances in the stack of technologies. And I will um, essentially touch upon that. So we think about tolerances and we take a sort of holistic approach to this. Um, so there's sort of, you know, if you're talking about screen printed electrodes, there's several modes of operation. There's voltammetry, cyclic, differential, square wave, um, pulse voltammetry. There's amperometry. You know, you can either have a single um, voltage or you could use pulse amperometry, for example. But we have voltammetry, amperometry, um, potentiometry and impedance spectroscopy. Whether tolerances and control of, for example, the working electrode is important in voltammetry, depends on how much care you're taking over your excitation strategy and your signal extraction from the raw data. So if you're not being super clever with your excitation protocols and your signal extraction, then tolerances are very important when doing a voltammetric assay. If um, you're doing an amperometric assay, like you know glucose sensors, lactate sensors, alcohol sensors, cortisol sensors, oxygen sensors, alcohol sensors, for example. If you're being clever with your excitation protocol and your signal extraction protocols, then tolerances around that working electrode are less important. If you're not being super slick with it, then you know, tolerances are important. There's an easy answer on potentiometry. Control of working electrode tolerances are less, a lot less important in potentiometry. In penis spectroscopy, um, whether Tolerances, for example, on the working electrode are important or not is the same for voltammetry and amperometry. It depends how clever you're being on the excitation and the signal extraction from the data. And I will cover these um, in a bit. So at ZP, um, we like to consider, even though we might be only being asked to think about the screen printer electrode, we do have to consider it in really in this whole technology stack. So Screen printed electro might get functionalized. By being functionalized, it becomes a biosensor. Um, now we have to consider the excitation of it. If you use a, a clever excitation protocol, you can generate a lot of features in your raw data. And because we have a proprietary system called Julie, we're able to get hold of those features. And we're able to basically, um, using Julie, we're able to iterate through the raw signal until we find those features in the raw signal that are most proportional to um, concentration. And by doing that, it means that rather than treating the screen printed electrode in isolation and saying, I need um, plus or minus 1% control on my working electrode area, because otherwise it's just going to translate all the way through to a poor um, accuracy later on. We say, no, we really have to consider every single step here, screen printing, functionalization, excitation, signal extraction, and then, you know, and we use Julie several times in this, and then we're iterating to actually find the best um, signal extraction. So people who have tight tolerances on their uh, screen printed electrodes, often because they're considering the screen printed electrode really in isolation from the rest of the technology stack. And so they're essentially putting all the emphasis on the screen printed electrode when really you should make a screen printed electrode that's good enough in the context of the functionalization step, the excitation step, and the signal excitation um, step. One of the things that we do at Zimmer and Peacock that makes us a bit different is um, if we're doing a screen printed electrode with you, um, whether it be an in vitro for an in vitro application or an ex vivo application, um, and we w our kind of mindset for 
for thinking about the signal um, extraction from the raw data is this. You know, we take a sensor, we put it in some electronics, for example, that we would have. Um, you would put the sample onto that sensor or you'd you know, put the sensor in the context that it was going to be used. Now, with that sample, we're also looking for a reference signal. So, for example, if it's just blood, then, you know, we can get a reference signal off a um, clinical analyzer or a blood gas analyzer. If it's something more wearable, then we can also use a off the shelf um, wearable sensor. But our protocol is this. Um, the screen printed electrode or the, you know, if it's been functionalized, the biosensor is tested on, on electronics that we trust. We often write apps to do this because it just makes it simpler to gather the data and upload the data. So the um, app Bluetooth connects to um, the electronics. The electronics does the um, analysis. And this means we can send, with our types of electronics, we can send quite sophisticated um, excitation protocols um, to the device under test. And we can get very feature rich um, data back. And the app allows us to upload the data and the data essentially goes to our um, Julie cloud where we can get a signal hopefully proportional to um, concentration. So low, medium, high, for example. Now, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're really aligned with the reference values. So we have raw signals off the sensor or screen printed electrode under test. And we have, let's say, the truth from either the third party wearable device or um, an IVD, sorry, an IVD, a um, blood gas analyzer. What we're trying to do is we're trying to ensure that we have strong correlation between the true result or the, the true value and what we're getting off the device under test or the device under development. Now, what we do is we use our Julie database to actually align these two data sets and see, you know, how good is the correlation? What's the offset like? And if it's bad, we essentially just do another iteration on the raw signal and we iterate until we get something that's much more aligned in terms of what the sensor is saying and what the reference value is saying. And then we can kind of consider that um, good. Um, that can be an, a, a fairly fast process or a very hard process. And it really depends on um, what the sample is, you know, what the reference um, sort of devices um you know, and what the application is, this is a discrete measurement or a continuous measurement. But what we're saying here is, even though you might be coming to ZP for the screen printed electrode, if you put all the emphasis on the control of the screen printed electrode and you don't consider all these other parts, which are, you know have been discussed here, which is excitation and signal extraction, um, you'll put too much emphasis on the screen printed electrode and you'll make that and end up having to make a very device with you know very small um, tolerances and therefore a very expensive device with low yield now something that really doesn't come in much is you know people request us to make um you know screen printed electrodes at a certain um uh, certain volume and i think i think quality is just just assumed now obviously at zp we are an iso 13485 um, company so we do have um, quite strict, um, let's say, rules and stuff around quality. So the typical question is, how much is it to make, you know, so many screen printed electrodes per month? And the question is never, you know, how much does it, how much will it cost to make screen printed electrodes? And by the way, we want to optimize the yield, the quality, and we want to have optimal functional performance. The second question is, I think, is is the slightly better question to really be asking. Now, when it comes to quality. You know, there's visual inspection, which you know I think everyone can do, um, especially with sort of, um, uh, especially with cameras and, and image recognition, it's quite straightforward. Something that we do at ZP, which is a little bit different, is electrochemical functional testing. So we do both, but the second line is makes us rarer. So the sort of general workflow that we have is, you know, we have manufacturing, um, we have OQC. From there, we put the data through Julie. And you notice that Julie keeps um, popping up. And then we, you know, we sort of essentially yield, um, we package the good and we can ship. Now, visual inspection, as I say, is quite straightforward. You know, you can, pr you can print a, you know, for example, a sheet of screen printed electrodes here. Um, we can take an image, put it through the Julie database. 
um, categorize um, or you know it, that will categorize what's considered good and what's bad we can highlight the bads and they don't have to, well they won't get uh, packaged and shipped and that obviously depend what passes this is actually also in part based on the framework agreement what have we agreed what have we contractually agreed to is considered to be good and what can be shipped um, electrochemical functional testing so at ZP we do have a database called Julie if you Google Julian Zimmer and Peacock, you'll soon find it um, and it allows us to do high throughput testing or volume testing of screen printed electrodes, for example, here we're doing cyclovoltammetry and it allows us to do batch analysis, you know, really quite, you know, hundreds of sensors at a time. We can produce statistical results on that, you know, and it basically stops us shipping something that's obviously grossly wrong. The reason this is important is when we were talking about, we receive specifications from people. Um, they never ask us, they never give us a specification around functional testing. And this functional testing is essentially, this is the sort of the crux of it. You know, what is it this electrode has to function like in order to be considered good by you? And this functional testing for me would actually allow you to not necessarily have to do um, roughness testing or electrical um, resistance testing because those two things will show up in this electrochemical testing anyway. So um, vision inspection is good because you'll just pick up the grossly, you know, the gross errors. The electrochemical testing is good because actually it will test the screen printed electrode in a way that is relevant to the way you're intending to use this sensor. And it will also, by the way, pick up on the roughness and the electrical resistance as well. So you didn't have to do those other tests, which are really just surrogates for functional testing. So ZP is able to do the functional um, testing. We're also, if, if we come up the value, we're also able to do um, for example, testing of, you know, of the scent. If, if the screen printed electrode becomes a biosensor, in this case, like a generation two glucose sensor, um, where we've tested again, this one between zero micromolar, 140 micromolar, we're able to test it. So we have lots of protocols for this kind of testing. Um, and then the data, you know, as you'd imagine, goes up to Julie, we can immediately analyze it and get a, you know, statistical analysis on, on it really without um, involving a data scientist. It's almost the, the, the person doing the testing in the lab can also be the person uploading the data and getting the report. And by the way, we can just print out reports as well off the database as well. So I'm going to talk now about sort of wafer mapping. Um, I made a statement earlier on, but I think ZP is really one of the very few um, industry scaled electrochemical sensor and biosensor businesses. And what I mean by that is you know, we've got um, a very large team of very, of highly trained people who do nothing but biosensor um, development, characterization and manufacturing every day. And this means that in manufacturing, we're able to um, pull electrodes off the line and we're able to test them by um, amperometry, if that's the way the sensor is going to be used, um, open circuit potential or potentiometry, if that's where the circuit is going to be used voltammetry if that's the way the screen printed electrode is going to be used and also EIS if that's the way the um, screen printed electrode is going to be um, used and we can apply that into something we call wafer mapping so for example whether you make a reel of um, screen printed electrodes or you do flatbed printing you essentially have um, here I'm showing sheets of electrodes in a, almost in a chronological order so what we can do at ZP is basically test the batch you know so we can go in there take a, uh, a sheet and test it and you want to test it because your design because you're coming to us for custom work can end up you know introducing artifacts that are unexpected and so it wouldn't be unusual to have a kind of column artifact where uh, as you went across a column you might have a difference um, in print thickness or a difference in area um, and it's not because of us, it's because of your design. So there could be um, column artifacts, there could be row artifacts, and then there could also be um, chronological artifacts. I suppose the longer you run a line for, um, then with time things can drift. Now what makes, um, and maybe I'm just going to throw in a quick anecdote here, that 
when glucose strips, people first wanted to make glucose strips and they wanted to make them calibration free. I mean, over 20 years ago, um, glucose strips would get shipped and they would have essentially um, calibration factors shipped with them. Then um, the, the next wave, they wanted to make them all calibration free. So this kind of variation in screen printed electrodes, um, as I show with time, um, row and column position, this was well known to those, um, C, um, some of those um, glucose strip manufacturers. And so one of them, what they did is in order to get rid of some of their artifacts from their manufacturing, they literally threw away two thirds of the screen printed electrodes and only kept the central, um, let's say portion. And they did it because of um, marketing reasons that they wanted to advertise calibration free. The way they did it was by throwing away two thirds of everything they produced, but they thought that was worth it for the um, manufacturing claim. So that's just a little bit of an anecdote. So at ZP, we are able to, um, we call it wafer mapping. We're able to go into the manufacturing run, electrochemically test it, and essentially come up with a heat map where we can sort of show if what's critical to you, if it's amperometry, then there might be a certain um, current density or current that's um, important to you. If it's voltammetry, it might be a certain area under the peak or certain peak that's a peak height that's um, important to you. But we're able to go in there and electric, even though we're electrochemically testing it, so you can visualize it, we can, so we can display it as a heat map. And what that means is we can, we can know, um, considering a, an individual electrode, we can actually you know, tag it in terms of what its electrochemical performance is. And we can call that, so for example, a sensitivity factor. This is really important because when you're talking about yield and tolerances, um, you can sometimes forgive on tolerances if you have a sensitivity factor, especially that sensitivity factor is able to um, go all the way through to your final product. So, if, for example, if you have a final product and the first thing that happens is the, you know, for example, the client scans it with their QR reader just to identify the sensor. If you're really clever, you might be able to carry the sensitivity factor into in with that QR code and actually uh, almost have an individual calibration on, based on that screen printed electrode in the final product. Um, now, what Judy also allows us to do is to interpolate. So if we've got enough data um, along the manufacturing line for those electrodes, because we can't 100% test everything, for those electrodes that we haven't got the data on, we can interpolate what the data would have been. Um, obviously, the bigger the gap between the measurement points, then um, you know, the more erroneous this can be. But we can actually do that again through our Judy database. So I've said a lot, I've said this, I've said at ZP, we do receive a lot of inquiries asking us to do um, custom manufacturer screen printed electrodes and here's our drawing, you know, can you quote on it? And it really misses all of sort of value and the points that, I, that I've tried to cover here, which is um, you need to, you know, have you considered other than the gross dimensions, have you considered the roughness? Have you considered the electrical resistance? Have you considered um, the functional testing of this? Have you considered that if we functionally test it, I mean, what are we going to consider good and what are we going to consider bad? Now, this is all important to us at Zimmer and Peacock because essentially we are ISO 13485 and we have to onboard people um, as a, essentially as a client. So I'm going to talk about the onboarding process. So if somebody comes to us, we, they want a um, screen printed electrode, that's fine. We have an onboarding process. Our onboarding process kind of looks like this, the, you know, that's we have non-client side, which I will discuss, near client side and client side. So on the non-client side, there'll be the initial sort of inquiry, which is fine. Um, the lightest engagement with us after you've sort of reached out to us is to have a probably a consulting meeting with us. It's It doesn't work that you can just, you know, here's a drawing, you know, give us a quote on it. I think that's what's sometimes wrong with the sort of, um, with the screen printing world, it's so nuanced actually manufacturing a screen printed electrode, especially a screen printed electrode that's actually going to become a sensor or biosensor. So there is, there needs to be a consultative nature to this. The lightest engagement with us in terms of science and or engineering is just to do a proof of principle with us. This is 111 hours worth of effort. 
and you know if the designs are fairly simple we can you know produce some first sheets of screen printed electrodes um, as a proof of principle now if you are really making a device um, in the veterinary space medical diagnostics even if it's not in medical you know you do need to have a quality system set up around your product so we have to do sort of client onboarding this is part of our ISO 13485 um, procedure um, now with client onboarding you know there's going to be at least we're going to have to produce a plan a Gantt chart you know what efforts it going to take to essentially get us from the point that we're having a conversation that you know we're having a conversation up here but we're going to have to basically turn that all into manufactured products down here and so we need a plan to get us through the clients what we call client side um we're a when we have a plan we're going to give you a presentation and or report um and we're also going to negotiate on the framework agreement the sort of essentially the contract that governs everything that goes on on the client side now proof of principle as i say is what we consider near client side for proof of principle we're going to lightly engage with you we're not going to deeply engage with you contractually we're not we're going to do 111 hours and prove whether something is doable or not doable most of the time it's do it's more than doable um if we are going to engage with you then we're very certain that we're going to be able to do it um now but if you're looking for that deeper engagement you truly want us to manufacture with you then we are going to have to onboard you and that's again we estimate it's between 50 and 100 hours so we do bill for the 100 hours any um, time that's not spent on onboarding we just translate it through to the client side now on the client side um, we have lots of ways through to sort of manufacturing scale up we have the zp accelerator if you're engaging with us to truly make the whole sense of biosensor then the accelerator does make a bit more sense if it's just the screen printed electrode and there is a lot of information by the way regarding accelerator on our various websites um, if you are just looking for a custom screen printed electrode then you know you would you would not necessarily go through the accelerator you would just come through our sort of custom um, development projects um, all of which all the data will end up in Julie and all the analysis will end up um, in Julie. And then under that, then we actually have what we I have it here termed limited availability. This is really, you, you don't go from um, idea to high volume manufacturing as everyone knows, you know, you don't just go there straight away. Um, you actually go there um, through um, small scale manufacturing, which eventually can become um, large scale manufacturing. Now, if people come to us, you know, as I say, for screen printed electrodes, we have the non-client side. So you, a potential client, you reach out to us, we consult with you in a pay consulting meeting. Um, we have near client side where you can do a proof of principle with us, 111 hours of some work. Um, if that looks good, you can transition onto onboarding, which is about another 100 hours of planning for the big effort and also putting the framework agreements in place. You can just go straight from consulting to onboarding. If you've got haven't got the time to go through proof of principle, we generally say the proof of principle takes about um, three months. It's a really it's a very small project for us. Um, if you want to go faster, then you probably have to jump straight onto onboarding. Um, and onboarding, as I say earlier on, planning, presentations, negotiations on framework agreements, and then we can sort of transition onto the client side. And on the client side, we've discussed it, potential clients, proof of principles, onboarding, then the sort of early development work, small scale manufacturing, then large scale manufacturing. So I think what often happens is people will come to us with a specification document. Um, it could be very detailed, not very detailed, depends. At ZP, we actually like to take a step back and actually ask, what's the requirements um, what is it you're really trying to achieve at a high level? Because people come to us, you know, essentially with detail and say, you know, this is what I want. But actually, let's take a step back. Now, that step back can be taken in the consulting period. It can take place in the proof of principle period. Um, or it can take place in the... Um, it, it can take place in the um, onboarding part. So we go from requirements then back to specification. We discuss it. We do 
we actually at this point then bring up the, uh, the whole thing about characterization of functional testing um, because it's often not discussed in the specification. Um, we have to do a risk um, register. What are the risks of this um, program? And we'll discuss that with you. Now, the risks are often for me really the budget. Do you really have the budget to do what you need to do? Do you have the budget to do the quality that you, that you say you require? And do you have the budget to do it in the time that you require? So that does need discussion. And that takes place um, mostly in the onboarding process and then takes place in the project itself. So we would have to go through prototype manufacturing where we would look at um, what IQC do we need to make your bespoke product? Um, what, um, so we would sort of have, you know, talk about and start to implement IQC, do the manufacturing itself, look at OQC, put these inputs and outputs through Julie, discuss it with you and iterate if we haven't reached um, something that we think is kind of, you know, ready to move on to the next phase. And then we go into alpha manufacturing. Um, similarly, we can iterate in alpha manufacturing until we reach the correct um, deliverables. Then beta manufacturing. And again, we can be iterating. So I just we're just laying out the idea that it's not just ideas of high volume manufacturing. Um, and then it's pilot manufacturing where we iterate. And then finally, we might go to full scale manufacturing. And even when you're doing full scale manufacturing, it's a, you know, I have worked in these large, um, or I, you know, I currently run a company like this as well, you know, where um, full scale manufacturing, it's, it's something that you keep, you know, you have to constantly keep an eye on, on uh, manufacturing. So in summary, um, at Zimmer and Peacock, we often have, um, let's say specification documents delivered to us. Um, we're very different that actually we want to add value and we may even have to take a relook at that specification document. So we have a potential client. Um, the first thing, the first thing that needs to happen is to have this paid consulting meeting from there. We might just do a light piece of engineering or science for 111 hours just to prove out something. Um, from there, we then transition you into our onboarding process, which is takes about 50 to 100 hours um, and that's charged for, um, or you can actually just jump from consulting to um, onboarding. So yeah, thank you very much. I've dis I have discussed specification. I have discussed specifications really of a screen printed letter. It has to sit in the context of the entire system. And I have talked about, you can actually forgive on things like tolerances depending on the holistic approach you take. And I have described that ZP is an ISO 13485 business and we have a very specific kind of onboarding process. Okay, thanks very much.